what uh, what language you speak, but if you think that that worship was lit or turned or awesome or or anointed or blessed or just freaking killer is what I say. But that was just awesome. I feel like we should just close in prayer and go home. That's not going to happen, but I feel like we should. So, but hey, uh, man, this is good stuff. Hey, I'm so thankful you're here. Um, not only because if you weren't here, I'd be talking to a room with no one in it, but but also because this is really great to be able to participate in what we've been singing about all morning, freedom, just the idea of being free and, and, and living past freedom, living past our, our junk, living past the distractions, all that stuff that's around us. I'm just thrilled that you're here to be a part of it, especially thrilled if you're here for the first time. We're just thrilled that you took a risk, trusted us, cared enough to just give it a try here at Journey. And so we're thrilled you're here. In fact, now, before we get to any of this stuff, would everybody take out your phone? I say that, and I left mine in the back. So take out your phone, okay? You got a phone. Take it out of your purse. Your you know you're going to play on it later. It's okay. It's totally okay with us. You can turn the brightness all the way up. We don't care. It's okay. You don't have to sneak it like it's no big deal. Okay, it's okay with us. If you, It's totally okay with me if you surf Facebook. Sometimes I have to do other things to be able to listen, okay? So it's okay with me if you want to play a game, surf Facebook, whatever. Right now, though, open up your web browser and go to ourjourney.news. We're going to need this a couple times today, so I want you to make sure you have it. If you're here for the first time or if you're here every single week, the first thing you're going to see when you go to ourjourney.news is the connection card. You got a paper version of it when you walked in the door. But, but man, we'd love it if you'd fill that card out, and it would help us so much because we, our staff, our leadership, all of the leaders around here, volunteers, we care about you more than just we care about a big crowd of people. So for us, the very best way for you to be more than just part of a big crowd of people on a weekend is for you to let us know you were here so that we can care about what's going on in your life. We can care about things that are happening, help you take next steps and pray for stuff that matters to you. So fill that card out. It's very, very important to us in terms of helping people rather than just helping a big crowd of people. So help me do that. If you don't mind filling that thing out. If you scroll over to the right a couple, you're gonna see message notes. You notice this isn't a website. I mean, it is a website, but it's really a site that's a Sunday morning portal for us. And it's really like an app that you don't have to install. So go to ourjourney.news every single week. Check in real quick. Let us know what's going on. And we're going to walk through some stuff in that area. And there's also information about stuff and all kinds of other stuff. But keep that handy because we're going uh, to refer back to it a little bit later. But hey, when you walked in, did you notice anything in your way? Yeah, you did, right? Like some signs in the way, right? You have to watch your kid. You're like, hey, watch your head. Don't hit your head on that, right? Some of you are like, go hit your head on that, would you? And I'm like, <laughs> you know, but, but the thing is that we have like these signs all over the place. They were in your way, weren't they? I mean, it makes it like, oh, man, I got to juggle one more thing. I already got enough stuff. I got a car carrier and I got the, I got the bag, I got the kids, I got the diaper bag. I got my husband who keeps getting some dra uh, distracted. And I got to corral everybody around one more obstacle as if we didn't have enough obstacles to get into church today. They're in our way in this morning. Now, we got really good people at Journey. Because I was like trying to make a big deal out of it. I've been around church a long time, and church people love to complain about stuff. And so I kept going up to people, and I'd be like, aren't those in your way? Oh, no, man, they're totally fine. Not my way at all. No big deal. You know, and I'm like, come on, where are all the real Christians who complain about stuff all the time? <laughs> like, we like to get bad, you know? So, But no, we got good people around here and stuff like that. But like, listen, here's the deal. Like, those things were in our way when, they're, when you're walking in the door, walking down an aisle, trying to get to a certain place. They're kind of in our way, but think about how much more of a hassle they are when you're when you're running unencumbered down the highway, and you're going 70, and you're like, man, traffic is great. You're just rolling, right? And you see one of those signs, and you're like, oh, no, because you know what's next, right? All the idiots who hit the brakes just to make sure that they still work, you know, like tap them, like tapping your brakes, like, just, let me just touch them one time. Dude, does anybody else hate brake tappers? I hate brake tappers. Steal off your brake. It drives me insane. Like, it's okay. I think it should be okay to murder people who are brake tappers. That seems totally reasonable to me. There's a reason that I don't get elected to anything. But, but here's the deal. Like, that stuff gets in our way on the way. There's distractions, and even more so than the signs. When you're driving, the construction gets in your way. You're driving down the road, the construction's in your way. The people who are stopping to look at the construction, the slowing down gets in our way. The plan for the freeway, the plan for the highway, the interstate, whatever you're calling it, 
the, the plan for that is for you to be able to travel unencumbered from state to state, an interstate system, 480,000 miles of interstate, just interwebbing across our entire, in our entire country, connecting one place to another with largely distracted, undistracted driving. That's a, a fantastic feat. Those signs were in your way when you walked in today. The signs are on your way, in your way when you, when you travel down the highway. But the bigger issue in our life is the distractions in our lives day to day that are constantly a part of everyday life. We're part of everything. We're distracted with our relationships. We're distracted with these things. We're distracted with trying to find something that makes Right now, what are you passionate about right now in your life? Most of us would go, I I'm a little freaked out. I, I don't know. Like, I'm passionate about my family. That'll get me off the hook, right? I mean, you know, most of us are like, passionate about them, leave me alone, right? <laughs> like, I'm passionate about my work. Well, maybe, maybe not. Some days, some days not. We try to find life and stuff, and we feel like we're just constantly trying things and coming up empty. I can't tell you how many times I thought, I've talked to people who go, man, I thought partying would bring me life it didn't. I thought money would bring me life and it didn't. I thought this would bring me life and it didn't. Have you ever walked outside after, after, a, after a day like today and it's rainy? I mean, this is like the crappiest weather, isn't it? Like, it, like when it's rainy and cold and windy and you're like, ugh, it's just icky out, you know? It like, feels like it's sideways and you're, like, your skin hurts from being out there. But have you ever walked outside when the sun comes out like even for five minutes. It did this morning for 10 minutes. I took a picture of it, posted it on Facebook. I was amazed, right? I'm like, this is gonna be awesome. We're gonna have the bike blessing today. We're blessing bikes today because I am not wearing this shirt for four weeks in a row, okay? <laughs> so one way or another, I'm, I'm gonna go buy a motorcycle and bless it and that's it, okay? So, <laughs> but here's the deal. Like, we, you ever felt life? Like just for a minute, you felt alive? Like just a, a blip? You're like, ah, oh, I feel free all of a sudden. Or you go see a movie. I love movies. I love violent movies, especially, right? I like when war movies have, I, love, I just like anything where there's a battle or a fight of some kind. I just feel like there's just, I'm just like, yeah, that's it. You know, there's a part of me that's just, maybe ladies, maybe it's true for ladies too. I don't know. But like, I don't, do you feel like you come alive during something like that? Or maybe it's like for some of you, you love to cook. You, when you put those ingredients in, you're just, I enjoy this. My wife enjoys cooking. I enjoy eating, if that wasn't obvious. But like, but like, she loves to cook, and she loves to make things that smell good. And the experience, I mean, guys and ladies alike love that part of it, right? Like some parts of it just make you come alive. There are little glimpses of life throughout all. You ever done things that you're passionate about? You're like, I'm a part of it, and I feel like I could do this all day. I just feel like, like a little part of me sparks to life when, when this happens in my life. Whether it's hunting or fishing or you do something and you're like, this brings me like massive amounts of joy. And I just, for one second, I feel alive. Why is it that we can list all these other things? We can list going outside or going to a movie or cooking or hunting or fishing or doing all these other things. And why is it? that nobody ever would make a list of that and go, I feel alive when I go to church. Because church is dead. Most of the time we show up at church and it's like the worst hour of our life, you know? We show up, you walk inside, you sit down in a chair and somebody talks for a while. And then eventually you're like, how much longer do I have to endure this, right? You feel like you're serving a jail sentence. You know, like I, I remember when I was a kid and I, I skipped the second service of our church and I was walking down to the gas station down the street from our church. I was 13 years old. I was walking down the gas station down the street from our church and one of the people from our church pulled over and said, what are you guys doing skipping church? And I'm like, look, I already served my church. Like, like I literally said, I already, I just, I was just, it was just the natural way I thought of it. Like, I look, I served already, I'm done. I, I am finished for the day, right? But we feel like we should get something. Like, why is it that the thing that Jesus said he came to give us life and to give it to us abundantly. Doesn't ever really give us life. Why is it that we've gotten stuck somewhere along the line? We've gotten distracted. The enemy's placed along the highway all these different distractions for us that keep us from being able to live the free way. And we get distracted into it. 
I love this verse in scripture. It's, it's in Galatians chapter five. And no matter what translation it is, it always gives it a different nuance in a different way. But I love this. It says, so Christ has truly set us free. Not kind of, not given us a picture of freedom like sunlight or cooking or, or hunting or fishing or whatever it is. God has, Christ has truly set us free. Now, make sure that you stay free. And don't get, don't get tied up again into the slavery of the law. And it's so easy, isn't it? And that's the reason why when we walk through the doors of church, it seems like the most ridiculous, mundane, religious experience ever. Because somewhere along the line, we fought instead of staying and driving on the freeway, instead of living free, we've chosen to become in bondage, right? Back into these laborious laws that have us checking boxes, jumping through hoops, feeling like we can out-Christian other people, right? I can do better than them. As long as I stay up in front of those people and I'm working this, I got these people to look up to, these people to look down on, that is what we generally look at as faith. 99 times out of 100, we raised our hand, we walked an aisle, we said a prayer, and that was the last time we really walked with Jesus. We responded for a moment and what was supposed to be a lifestyle. And that's the reason why, because then we, right after that moment, we are like, okay, now I go to church. Now I read my Bible. Now I check this box, check that box. Oh, now the pastor wants me to serve. Okay, I'll serve. Okay, and he wants me to give, and I'll give. And then at some point, we, we lose the heart of it. We lose sight of what really matters in the end of the freedom that God wants to give us, the freedom that we've been singing about, that, that little bit of glimpse of life that you got while we were singing, and it just felt like you're like, I could come alive in a second. And there's just a little bit of you that welled up in you, and, and then it went away. Because we're going back to the check in the boxes. I got to get my notes out. And I got to do this thing. I got to do this stuff so I can make sure I'm staying awake. I got to make sure my husband's awake, right, not falling asleep. But isn't that how it winds up being? We just wind up getting stuck in the mess. Lifeless faith was never God's plan. Lifeless faith was never God's plan. I, I can't believe it. I mean, like, I got to be honest with you. Doing church this way has ruined me. It has completely ruined me for regular church, okay? Because I sometimes, Sheila and I are on vacation. I'm not saying whose church we go to, but we might go to somebody's church. And I, the minute I walk in the door, I'm like, I want to stick a needle into my eye. Like, we have, listen, we have the most compelling message ever told. God, who created the heavens, right, stepped out of heaven and became a man. Philippians 2 says he set aside the independent use of his deity. He put it aside and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. This Friday, we'll celebrate the death, celebrate the death of God, and that he was buried. And then there was this moment that we sang about a second ago when his dead body began to breathe. I never imagined it until we sang that song, that there was a moment before the tomb opened up, before the stone rolled away, there was a moment where that still stagnant air inside of this tomb began to move because Jesus began to breathe and his, his lifeless body came back to life. He moved the stone and walked out life uh, living again, not just living from the dead, but listen to this, to give us life, to give us victory over sin and darkness. And I got to tell you something, that makes me come alive. That's amazing stuff. That, like that, that deserves at least one amen. Okay, there you go. So like, just be careful with those things because they will mess with everybody. But like, but the thing is that that stuff's amazing. We have the most compelling story ever told. It should be a sin to make it lame. Like it should be a sin for you to go to church and not feel alive a little bit of like, this is joyous. This is amazing. But religion, man, it sucks the life out of us. There's this passage, we just looked at it, Philipp, I mean, in Galatians chapter five, where he, where he says, you've been set free. Be careful not to get wrapped back up into this old way of doing things, this old way of jumping through the hoops and checking the boxes and measuring up and figuring out how to fall into the law. Now, I want you to know something that Galatians five, verse one 
has a couple of verses around it. And we're really bad about this. Sometimes we take out verses we like, and we just kind of let the rest fall apart. But it's really important that we kind of back up just a tiny bit. Because right before Galatians 5.1 is the tail end of chapter 4. In the tail end of chapter 4, Paul tells us about some stuff that those of you maybe who enjoy studying the Bible like I do, like I enjoy it. I love studying, reading it into the stories. I enjoy that stuff. It's, it does bring me life. But here's, here's an interesting thing about it. Right before this, he tells these stories of kind of hearkening back. Now, remember, he's writing to an audience that's not like us. He's writing to people who know the names of all these people, okay? But look at what it says. The scriptures say, this is back in Genesis, that that Abraham had two sons, okay? There are two sons, one from his slave wife and one from his freeborn wife. Now, this gets a little confusing, but God made a promise to Abraham. He said, listen, I'm gonna give you descendants the same as the number of all the stars. So like, that's a lot of descendants, right? You so many that you can't count them. And so he says, okay, I'm gonna do this. And Abraham's like, yeah, that's great. But my wife is, you know, kind of old, wrinkly. He didn't say all that stuff. He just said she's old, okay? So, cause he knew it was good for him. And so, he said, my wife's getting on in years and she can't have like that kind of thing. She's barren. She can't do that. God said, trust me, it's going to be okay. So time starts going on. He tells Sarah about it. Sarah is like, okay, good. And then eventually they got to a place where just like us, when we get kind of bored waiting on God, we kind of go, well, maybe we need to do something to kind of you know, help it along a little, right? So Sarah says to Abraham, why don't you, uh, why don't you sleep with my maidservant, Hagar? Her name's Hagar. It can't be a good experience. Okay, I'm just saying. All right, so this is probably not an exciting thing. He's probably just like, let's get the deal done, okay? So he says, let's do this. And so she makes, now listen, you don't need to know all this stuff, but if you want to study, it's fantastic, unbelievable, deep study, fun to look at. But here's the deal. Today, every conflict in the Middle East comes down to these two sons. When you watch the news, it all comes down to these two sons. The son from her freeborn the son from Sarah, the freeborn wife, and the son from the slave. And it's, there's, so much, there's so much tension just based on these two people that everything kind of just seems to swirl around it. Now, the son of the slave board was, was born in a human attempt. That's a big deal. A human attempt to bring about the fulfillment of God's promise. For us, it's the human attempt to bring life. The son of the slave-born wife is the human attempt to bring out life. For us, that's how religion is. Religion is our human attempt to make it feel like we're connecting with God, but there's no life there. He says the, the, the slave wife brought about this son that is a human attempt to do what God wants to do, and then, but the son of the freeborn one was given, uh, was God's fulfillment of, of this promise. Abraham says, this is where the lineage, this is where the descendants come from. This is where the power is. It's not in the fact that he has a son. It's in the promise that God makes. It's not in the religious observance of Jesus. It's in the experience of Jesus that we really find life. Now it goes on a little bit. These two women serve as an illustration of God, of God's, uh, of, of God's, um, I think we switched. Do we switch? Oh yeah, there you go. I switched it and I was trying to read the bottom of it and it wasn't there anymore. Okay, the first woman, Hagar, represents Mount Sinai where the people received the law and then that enslaved them. They get this law from Moses and it this first slave-born son represents this idea that we can jump through hoops and that we can measure up. And God gives this law for the express purpose of reminding people, listen, you can't do enough to earn it. That's huge. You can't do enough to earn it. Why? Because you already have it. You can't do enough to earn God's love because you already have God's love. You can't measure up to it. It's yours and it's free. That's what the second born son is. And he says, and now Jerusalem is like Mount Sinai in Arabia because she had her children in slavery to the law. But the other woman, Sarah, re represents the heavenly Jerusalem. She is the free woman and she's our mother. Like what he's saying here is that these two women, these two families, these two dynamics serve as an illustration for us to understand that one way is empty and hopeless and lifeless, but following Jesus is not empty and hopeless. It's not lifeless. Jesus is the key. In fact, 
That's the most thing, important thing you can get from this whole thing is that you can't live the free way without Jesus. And I don't mean that without, uh, without a moment with Jesus. Like I said earlier, like a lot of times for us, a lot of us at some point in our life, we were sitting in a chair or on a carpet circle or out in a backyard somewhere. And somebody talked about Jesus, how he loved us and that and he gave his life for us and that he died for our sins. And they said, if you wanna go to heaven, raise your hand. I, I wanna go to heaven, right? And we did, and we cared at that one moment. We were sitting in our seat and we wanted to follow Jesus all the way to heaven, right? I call it kind of the church I grew up in anyways, was, I call it kind of a believe and behave economy. Like I accept Jesus at some point here for a date somewhere out there. Like I accept him today so that someday when I die, I get to go to heaven. And in the meantime, I'm just supposed to check the boxes and do the things I behave, right? My job is to believe in Jesus here and then just mind my manners until one day I'm gonna die. And then I get to go to heaven. But here's the thing. Jesus isn't inviting us into a get out of hell free card, right? He wants us to follow him. You remember that day that you felt like you were like, I want to raise my hand. I want to I want to respond. I want to follow Jesus. Remember that part of you that came alive for a fraction of a moment, enough for you to get up the guts to raise your hand or walk the aisle or sing the song or get in the water or make this profession of faith. That part of you is what Jesus was dying to bring to life. It's that part of you that gives you freedom. It's that part of you that God wants to redeem in you. And he wasn't just looking, this is huge, for one or two steps that secure a date out there. He's looking to join him on a journey, to walk with him, to be with him, to learn, to grow, to, to be challenged. What is that? To be challenged. <laughs> Freaked me out. I thought it was like a bat or something. <laughs> Sorry. What were we talking about? All right. <laughs> but whew, I don't really know what we're talking about. Oh, yeah, journey with Jesus. Okay. So, sorry, I got sidetracked there. I don't know if you noticed. But here's the deal. Like, the most important part of this isn't the following Jesus across the line of faith. The most important part of this is following Jesus in our faith. It's the journey with Jesus is the destination, not just to secure a point out there somewhere that might happen one day when I die so that I can eventually spend eternity in heaven instead of hell, but spending today in Jesus, there is only the kingdom. It doesn't have an end or a beginning. It is today as much as it is forever. That's huge. You can't live the freeway. You can't live the life. You can't walk into church, walk into your faith and experience that part of you that comes alive without walking with Jesus. You won't find it in religion. It's useless. You won't find it in observances. It's, it's hopeless. You won't find it in good behavior because it's lifeless. You find it in Jesus. He's the message of life. Now listen, I'm not saying that church is bad. I give my life to church. It's, it's everything I do circles at some point back to church. But what about this? What about that? Like my family, my wife and I care about the church. We love the church. So I'm not ragging church. And I'm not saying you shouldn't behave. By all means, you should behave. Like you should definitely do the right thing because the wrong thing takes you further away from Jesus. And this is the reason why most of the time when you show up at church, we're talking about lifeless things. Can I tell you why? This is just an insider secret. Because as a pastor, it's easier to control people. It's easier to stand up front and preach guilt and condemnation. It's easier to put you into places and tell you what to do and what not to do. It's easier to tell you should look and act this way and not look and act that way. Because when you look and act some other way, it makes me scared that you're, off, that you're gonna run away. And it's easier to kind of control you if I can tell you what to do and what to say and how to think and how to feel. And here's the thing that we wind up doing more often than not is because we're afraid, and you'll hear it in our conversations, we're afraid that if we preached freedom, if we talked about what really comes alive inside of you, that we can't control that, and that you're gonna use that as a license to sin. You're gonna say, well, I, if I can't earn God's love because I already have it, then, then you're gonna feel like it's okay just to do whatever you wanna do. Here's the problem, most of us, spend our lives trying to please Jesus 
well, if I do this, it'll please Jesus. If I do this, it'll please Jesus. And the problem with that is that we're stuck in this religious economy. And you can't live life like that in this religious economy. You can't live life stuck in this like day-to-day trying to make Jesus happy because here's the problem. It's not Jesus, it's us. The problem is whatever we do to make Jesus happy, there's always more that we can do, right? Well, maybe if I do this, it'll make him happy. Maybe if I do this, it'll make him happy. Maybe if I do this more, if I give more, if I serve more, if I do more, it'll, see, it'll make him happy. Do you see why it's so easy for pastors to preach this? Because it makes it easy. It's you to do more and give more and serve more. But here's the deal. It doesn't give you life. What I'd love for you to do is not jump through the hoops and check the boxes, but I'd love for you to come alive in your faith so much so that you're like, I love being a part of what God's doing. I love partying, and it brings me life to serve. It brings me life to give. It brings me life to be a part of this. I want to walk with Jesus and experience something that I can't experience just by, by behaving. You can't walk in the freeway until you, in this religious economy. You can't get stuck in the, I do these things, I say these prayers, I jump through these hoops, check all the boxes, and God loves me. Because here's the trick. He loves you anyways. (laughs) He loves you anyway. He loves you if you didn't. He loves you exactly where you are. Even if you never moved from where you are, he loves you exactly where you are. Now it turns my behavior not into trying to please him to earn his love, but turning my behavior into a place where I'm like, look, I have to honor a Jesus that loves me even if I don't love him back. Like to me, then I go, man, I, this is my behavior is a response to the life I've been given, not an obligation to try and earn his love. That's a powerful difference. He goes on to say this in the next verse, in, in verse two, after that first verse, he says, don't get stuck, you know, like try to get back into your old way of doing things. And he says this, listen, I, Paul, tell you this. I think he's saying that because he's trying to say, listen, this isn't a lady I'm telling you this. I'm, I'm, I mean it. I, Paul, clarifying this is a Paul, right? If you're counting on circumcision to make you right with God, then Christ will be of no benefit to you. Now, listen, I've been a pastor for 25 years. I've never in my life said, asked somebody, say, so what are you counting on to go to heaven? Oh, I'm circumcised. <laughs> yeah. Like, or I've never in my life, I've asked a lot of people, they tell me, I just don't feel like I'm going to go to heaven. Why do you feel like you're not? Well, I'm not circumcised. Well, I got a cigar cutter. Like, like, <laughs> so, like <laughs> that and a good napkin. I mean, what else do we need? <laughs> but like, we have this, come on, that's fine. All right. So, but here's the thing that we struggle with, isn't it? Like, what does this mean to us? What Paul's saying to us isn't so much about circumcision or uncircumcision. What he's saying is like, your empty religious stuff isn't going to matter to us anymore. It's not going to earn you anything. It will be of no benefit to you to be religiously observant because being religiously observant without the redemption of heart, without your life coming alive will be of no benefit to you. It will do you no benefit to show up a journey. It'll do you no benefit to serve or to give. It'll do you no benefit for you to raise your hands. It does no benefit to get the goosebumps. It has zero to do with anything if your heart's not behind it. So living the free way isn't something that you can do without Jesus. It's not something that you can do while you're stuck in the religious economy. We've got to understand that our behavior has to shift from trying to earn God's love to trying to express it. I'm going to say that again. Our behavior has to shift from trying to earn God's love to trying to express it. Two weeks from now, a week after, thank you, by the way, but two weeks again from now, right after Easter, the week after Easter, we're starting a series that I think is going to put legs on this for a lot of us. I read a book um, probably a year ago by Bob Goff. I was a little late to the party because it's been out a little while. It's called Love Does. Love Does is a blast to read. If you're, how many of you are not readers? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Okay. You're going to love this book because it's not like reading. It's not, you don't, you don't have to learn anything. You don't have to write anything down. There are no right answers. It's a book of stories. Most of the stories are like eight pages long and they call that a chapter. It's awesome. And, and like there's stories and he laughs and he says on account of, and he says things that don't make any sense. And he, and he, and he puts his cell phone number at the back of the friggin' book and says, if you like it, 
call me. And then he answers his phone. Okay. Like it's crazy. This book is nuts. Okay. So Sorry, I get really excited about it. So the week after Easter, we're going to start this stuff. We're going to read this book together as a church. We're going to talk about it some together uh, over those four weeks. Um, and we also want every single one of you, and not the guy behind you, every one of you in a group. If they all fill up today, we will find more groups if I got to leave 10 of myself, okay? So here's the deal. We need you. We want you to be a part of a group. So here's where I told you you'd need it. Get your phone out, Okay. Everybody get your phone out. Everybody do it so that way nobody feels guilty. You're like, oh, I forgot to do it. Just get your phone out. And if you're not going to do what I'm telling you to do, surf on Facebook for a minute. Okay. So go to your web browser and you go back to our journey.news and scroll over a couple more. And you're going to see community groups. I think it's like turquoise or blue or green, depending on your eyes, because I don't know what color it is. It's some sort of bluish green thing. Click on that. And when you go on, you just scroll down, you'll see community groups page. Then when you click on that, you're going to see a list, a picture of small group leaders. So you can tell how weird they are. Okay. So, and then you're going to read a short bio about them. I really want you to stop for one moment and read my bio that I wrote for our family. Okay. Because it's, it is very helpful for you to understand our family. Okay. So scroll down. Find the group that, you, that works for you. There are some that have childcare, some that don't, some that meet on Wednesday nights, some that meet on Sunday nights. There's one, if you're in junior high, not junior high, I'm sorry, if you're a junior or senior or early college, there's a junior, senior, early college group. So like 11th, 12th, and fresh, some of you are reading that, I can tell. But, um, but do that. Sign up for a group today for Love Does. It's four weeks. Listen, I could go to hell if I knew I'd be back in four weeks. Okay, like, so... Like you can sign up, this will be a blast. You're gonna love it, do a part of it because here's the deal. You can't live the freeway while you're stuck in the religious economy. So learn, instead of trying to earn God's love, let's, let's begin to do love like it expresses God's love. That's a huge difference in the way we think. Sign up for a group right away. And I'm gonna wrap things up, land the plane, but I wanna just tell you about this one last thing. You can't live life the freeway when you're running on empty. You can't live life the freeway when you're running on empty. Last week, we gave you these cards, and um, this one's bugging me because it has bubbles in it. But these cards are helpful to us. They say, um, are you running on empty? Because we all know somebody who's running on empty, right? We know a friend, a coworker, ourselves, cousin, brother, nephew, that's running on relationship empty. They're running on financial empty. They're running on, on empty energy. They're running on empty. Just You know that they're living in a way where it's just like, you know, I love you and I care about what's going on in your life and I want to invest in you. So we gave you these cards because these cards will make it easy to invite them, okay? So what I want you to do is I want you to have these cards and I want you to take them and I want you to find somebody and give it to them. I was talking to a couple of people this week, stories, right? I love them. Somebody this week said to me, they uh, they sent me a message and said, I, I Took, took the card like you said, and I invited a friend, and I went up to him, and I gave it to him, and she said, Jeremy, if you guys don't do this again next year, I'm going to buy my own cards and put my own stickers on them, because this made it so easy, it was unbelievable, okay? that That's killer stuff, right? Then another person sent a message to Sheila and said they were like, I don't know what to do. I was trying to decide, because I'm not really an outgoing person, whatever, prayed about it, felt like God was telling me to hand it to the person, to the lady at the deli. And so she went to the lady at the deli and said, hey, um, I just really feel like God wants me to ask you to join us in church. And here's, here's a $5 gift card for, you can get some gas or you can get some bread, my beer for all we care. But like, like, here's this thing. And we want you to have this because it, it, in a way to invite you to join church and in the service times around here, she was like, the lady goes, can I come to that side and, and hug you? And, and she was like, just blown away that somebody that she didn't know would care about her and think about her, this like faceless person at the deli. That's amazing stuff. And I, I wanna tell you something, some of you are like, I'm not inviting anybody if they're gonna hug me. It's, that's not a normal response, okay? But that, that's so cool. It's so easy. We gave out 350 of them last week, $355 gift cards last week. But I think we had another 150 or so before first service. I don't know how many we have left, but I know I have five. There, there, five. I have five, um, Chuck, it has them, you know, the guy with the dreadlocks, you've seen him around. Chris, you saw him up here earlier. Bryce, the guy who used to have the beard, he's, he has them. Um, he has, the, there's some at the connection table. 
there's some in the starting point room. We want them to have you, we want you to have them so bad. The only place that you can't get them is probably the bathroom, okay? And that's because they're icky. So, so we'll just, but if you want these, we want to give you one of these or two of these. Does somebody want these? I got these five left right here. There you go. So somebody want, I got a couple more. There you go. There you go. Anybody else? Who wants these right now? I can't see. There you go. There you go. Here, that person over there, I saw one. There you go, Larry. Oh, yes, I did it. Did you see that? I didn't even cut her face off. All right. So here's the deal, though. Easter's next week. We're going to have a blast. I'm telling you, Easter is like the Super Bowl of church. I love it. It is huge for us. We have so much fun, but it's not about our services. It's about our Savior, and I don't mean that in some cheesy way. But here's the deal. You're running on empty? That's what Easter is all about, right? I mean, we run on empty. That is a big deal. We run our lives out of the power of an empty tomb. And we're going to make a big deal out of that next week. So if you will take a risk and invite somebody, there are four services next week, 4.30 and 6 o'clock on Saturday, 9.30 and 11 on Sunday. Be here. Um, if you are not busy or if you can cancel it, or skip it, we could use your help in like a thousand areas. So there are lots and lots of opportunities. Um, in a minute, we're gonna take an offering and Chris is gonna wrap up with some announcements. But before we do that, um, I would love an opportunity just to um, try to calm down and pray um, about what God's doing next week. So let's pray together. Jesus, um, man, it is, it is life giving to us. Um, to just experience you, to know you, um, to be redeemed by you, to be made whole by you, um, to know that we don't have to earn your love, that you love us anyway, it, it, that blows us away. Lord, next week, um, somewhere in the neighborhood of a thousand people walk through the doors here. And um, to us, that is mind blowing that you would trust us with that many stories and that many lives, and that many people's stories, and their families. And Lord, we just, um, we know that this is all empty and worthless and religious and lifeless if you're not at the very center of it. And so we ask again, Jesus, that you would just be the very centerpiece of every moment, of every word we say, of our conversations, of our motivations as we invite people as we care about them and reach out to them, Jesus, we just ask and invite you into the very middle of that. And Lord, we ask as those people walk through the doors that they wouldn't experience journey, they wouldn't experience good music, they wouldn't experience uh, an engaging hour, but they would experience you in a new and fresh way that gives them life. God, we consecrate next week to you. Again, we just pray that you'd bound and, and protect us that week. As we go through this week, I pray, God, that you go before us in every invitation. God, that you just simply guide and direct every single person with every single card and every word that we say would make it fruitful in a way that brings life to people. God, we ask that in your name. Amen.